Are you allowed to make a traditional soup on Shabbos? Ask the crowd if the noodles are pre-cooked. Are the noodles pre-cooked? Yeah. Um, I'm not a mumkha these things, but it seems like a little bit of research that most Rabbanim say that you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to make the noodle soups on Shabbos when the noodles, if it's just the pouch and just the powder, just the spices and, and hot water, that's more kal, it seems like, it's more lenient. But the noodles themselves are forbidden this way it sounds like, even on a Klishlishi, everyone says that it's, it's, it's different types of issues that they come with. <laughs> What's the din with contact or hugging relatives, sisters, aunts, grandparents, cousins, etc.? Same question is asked in a few places. So, in Shulchan Aruch, in the Simen of Evan Ha'ezer, Simen Chof Aleph, Siv Zayin, the Mechaber writes, HaMechaber ko yamenashik achas meharoye sheli bishalodem noikfei aleyam, someone that has chibuk or nishuk, hugging or kissing uh, any of the people that you're not allowed to marry, but you have no feelings, no, no, no marriage kind of feelings towards them, for example, a sister that's older, not necessarily older than you, meaning she's older, and she's older than a mitzvah, or we'll soon see in a moment what that means, more details. Or your father's sister, your aunt, the Chayetzebehem. Even though there's no hano, there's no pleasure of marriage, Kivyochel in this union. It's very dis disgusting. And it's forbidden. And it's an idiotic act. You should not get close to any kind of erva, whether she's old or young. Besides, a father to his daughter or a mother to her son. And he has a few more details about that, about even a father and a daughter and a mother and a son. It depends to what age, but says, even when they're older, there's no problem of chibu v'nishu. And the Sifkot and the Chalkas Machagi Sifkot and Yud and also the Beishmul Sifkot and Yudalid discuss grandparents and they say the same thing applies to grandparents that it's also okay as long as the Shem Shamayim so hugging a grandmother or a grandfather hugging a granddaughter is okay and he also says Ruhu Adin La'achai Seiktan also a younger, a younger sister and the, he has more details regarding uh, what's, what's the age of the younger sister that is considered okay. So he says if it's a three-year-old sister, that's what it says here in the, in the, in the Shulchan Aruch. Igres Meisha, Rabbi Meisha Feinstein, in Yeredeya Chedel Beis, Simen Kuf Lamed Zayim. So he also is, summarizes the same halachis, and he says, the heter is only a father to a daughter and a granddaughter, or a mother to a son and a grandson. And and then he says, there's, when it comes to... Um, when it comes to a niece, or it comes to a first cousin, it's yeah, Isur Gomor. And you have to be Moiche, because a person does have Taiva or hero and such relatives, so it is forbidden completely. Regarding a sister and an aunt, so he brings, what we, we, from the Shulchan Aruch, what we just said, that it's Meguna B'yeser, it's disgusting, and it's, uh, it's forbidden, and it's an uh, idiotic act. But he says, at the end of the day, even though these are such hard Lashonis, the fact that it wasn't put in the same category as the other one shows that it's not on the same level. And he continues later with the sweet stories in the Gemara. And the kids are regarding the ages. There's a little bit of a, what's considered the age of a sister, that it's okay or not. But when it comes to, aunt, uh, to an aunt, so it's very clear that it's not the right thing, it's not appropriate. That's pretty much all the details I think that was, were asked. If you want more information, again, Evan Ezer, Simon Chafalif, Siv Zayi. Why do yeshivas not have mandatory chess tournaments? And can we please have mandatory chess tournaments? Since the Rebbe played chess. Thank you. So I was thinking and thinking, what's a good answer? And finally I came up with a good answer. Hasogas Gvul. There's already a yeshiva tournament now. There's a yeshiva chess camp. Whoever wants, you can sign up to chess camp. Um, it's now the summer. It's uh, every day for just two sections. There's two sessions. I think a morning section and afternoon session with a, a free read that's a, a chess professional. And he, it, I don't know what his prices are. It doesn't have prices, but uh, he's, a, he's a chess master and coaches and all his actions. So I'm not going to take away from his uh, thing. Yeah, everyone here. Uh, that's the only answer I came up. We say that some goyinim allow pass akum for only Shabbat, for oinik Shabbos. 
you need Lechem Mishnah. So if you have Pas Yisrael for Lechem Mishnah, can you then have Pas Akum for only Shabbos? Is Lechem Mishnah a part of your Enoch Shabbos? If so, then we're saying that you can have Pas Akum for Lechem Mishnah. So, well, the Pas Akum questions you can always ask me in the Seder. It's not really necessary to ask it in the Q&A. But Bakoponim, the Pashtas, the whole header for Pas Akum and Shabbos is there shouldn't be an element of, of Tainus. There shouldn't be any kind of fasting and suffering. So therefore, in Bepashtus, if you have Lechem Mishnah that's Pas Yisrael, you would not be allowed to have Pas Akum for Shabbos because you already have your, 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 your you already, you're, you're already not fasting. So the, the element of Oynik Shabbos, if you want to say that the Lechem Mishnah is part of Oynik Shabbos or not, but the Pashtus, you would be, for, if, be forbidden to eat in that case Pas Akum. Another question of I don't know, and Pas Akum. The tour said that after three days of fasting, you're allowed to eat pasakum. Uh, this makes sense since after fasting, bread is very good for, for filling you and sustaining you. So why is it that for many years, I don't know about now, there was a rule that the day after Pesach, you can go and buy and eat pasakum. You didn't fast, you ate the whole Pesach. You don't need bread, so why was your head and given to do so? You can survive without it. So I think the Bakr is making a very big uh, misunderstanding. The header that the two writes, which uh, we learned also in the other Rishonim, is regarding Pas Balabayis. Pas Balabayis, there was a header that I eat after three days, because if a person was fasting, or according to other Rishonim, even if you don't actually fast for three days, you just you know that you're going to fast if you don't need to eat it now. The meaning that people would buy Pas from Goyim after Pesach was regarding Pas Palter. If I understand correctly, and the it's a whole different child, it's a whole different header, as we learned in the, the Sugya, that Pas Palter is a lot more cal, and it's not nothing to do with the uh, sakana or in danger. Is there a difference between a song and a nigan, besides for it being holy? So the way I understand is there's in Hebrew the two words are nigun and shir. The way I understand nigun means a tune and shir means a song. And the difference between a tune and a song is that a song has words and a tune doesn't have words. Even though you can argue, I, I, I didn't see a source for this, this is my understanding. So but mainly you can have holy tunes and holy songs, and you can have unholy tunes and holy songs. But shir, nigun, the word nigun means tune, that can be any kind of tune. Again, any, uh, in modern Hebrew, instead of the word tune, they use, uh, nigun, they use the word mangina. But if I understand, it's the same thing. It means a tune, and a shir means a song, with words. What's wrong with playing cards? Um, this was when I was a kid, I was always told this, that there's a Bardichever, the Kedushas lady writes that every card has a tremendous amount of tumor. Uh, this question came, comes up every once in a while, and uh, one time that I said it, the Bukha came over to me afterwards and showed me other sources, which I already forgot by now, but this is a famous thing that Kedushas lady writes, that every card has a tremendous amount of tumor, and it should not be in a Jewish home, and therefore it's not allowed in Yeshivas. For some reason, I'm not sure, it's accepted that the cards that are forbidden are dafka, the ones that are... Uh, Aces, spades, uh, diamonds, and hearts. Those are that the regular set of playing cards, what they call. Mashenkin Uno cards and other types of cards, for some reason, it's not considered that. That's, I, I never heard people, Machmir, not to have those kind of cards. So it's understood to me as, uh, that, that it's specifically referring to those type of cards. Yes? I heard um, my friend knew, knew a rabbi, and like, maybe that's for some reason, he was very interested. I heard that's like two symbols specifically from the playing cards maybe that's the reason why Dafka those have more to can be the question would be if that's the case can you remove those two symbols unless it's the whole spade or the whole heart then you I mean, can use the whole card in my, in my that I just covered it with sharpie and it but, but the, 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 is it one of the jack queen and king or it's something else one of those now, but then it would if it's only one of those three then it makes sense you could just get rid of those cards and have a replacement right. but, but the, way, the way I understand it's the whole the Kedushas lady is the whole set of playing any card of that playing card. But for some reason, Uno cards, even though in the words of the Kedushas lady, are just playing cards. But for so some reason, it's accepted that it's Tafka, the, the, those kind of cards, Uno cards, and the uh, Tera cards, and all the, the other cards that we have, are seemingly not included in the problem. You don't get it. Mamish don't get it. You don't get it. Why do we say Balshemtiv stories at Lava Malka? So I found an interesting source that it says that everybody knows that Lava Malka is a time to mention Elio Anovi. Elio Anovi is that after Gehenna takes people out after Shabbos. So Matzah Shabbos, it's a, there's even a Seder for people to learn Matzah Shabbos 
the Sefer of Elio Anovi, which is Tanud of Elio. So I heard a word. Now, who was Elio Anovi's teacher? No. Elio Anovi's teacher? Achi Ashiloini. Which other Talmud did Achi Ashiloini have? Baal Shem So just like we mentioned Achi Ashiloini's first Talmud, Matzah Shabbos, we also mentioned the second Talmud, Matzah Shabbos, as well. That's why you mentioned the Baal Shem Yachad Imzeh Tz Yedua, that is, uh, I think the Rebbe said also know that, he, that the, the word in the Welt is that mentioning a story of the Baal Shem Tov and Matzah Shabbos is as gula for Parnasa. So the, the Tzadikim said, I think the Rebbe mentioned also that there are three Lav Davkas in that word. It's Lav Davka, the Baal Shem Tov, it's a story of any Tzadik. It's Lav Davka, Matzah Shabbos, it's any time a story of a Tzadik is a, is, is a Skula. And the third thing is Lav Davka, a Skula for Parnasa, it's a Skula for all good things. What is the proper way to hold hands while saying Maida'ani and why? So there's a Sikh of the Friedrich Rebbe. I'm going to read it. It's written in Yiddish. I'm going to read it in English. He writes, when I was a young child, as soon as I began to speak, my father, the Rebbe Rashab, told me, whatever question you have, you should come ask me. Even though I had specific people that were responsible for my education, nevertheless, my father, the Rebbe Rashab, told me, anything that you have to ask, you should ask by me. When I was educated about saying Maida'ani, I was told to put my hands together, one hand to the other hand, and bend my head a little bit to say Maida'ani. When I got a bit older, but I was still a child, so I asked my father, the Rebbe Rashab, why is it that when you say Maida'ani, you have to put your hands one to the other and bend your head? So he answered me, the truth is you're not supposed to ask Farvos, you're not supposed to 